To all the drivers out there delivering holiday cheer across our great country, season's greetings and a huge thank you from the Allen Lund Company. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. You've heard the stories about truck drivers being the victims of predatory towing practices. You might have gone through the situation yourself. A new report from the American Transportation Research Institute sheds some new light on just how bad things have become, and it uncovered some eye-opening statistics. Atri Research Associate Alex Leslie breaks down what they found. Landline Magazine's Mark Schremer joins the show, fresh off a visit to the Midwest Commercial Vehicle Safety Summit. Mark reports on his conversation with FMCSA Administrator Robin Hutchison and breaks down a session that let truck drivers speak their mind through a proxy. But did the message get through? And finally, as a token of thanks for the help Boston provided back in 1917 during the Halifax explosion, the province gifts a Christmas tree to the city every year. We speak with the driver of the tree about this annual act of gratitude and the decades-old tradition. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. Our top story today... An electronic logging device recently removed from FMCSA's list of registered devices has been reinstated. Motor carriers and drivers may now begin using the CIELD logs device again to record and transfer hours of service data. Last week, FMCSA removed it and nine other ELDs from its list, saying the revoked devices no longer comply with minimum requirements. The other nine remain on that revoked list. Carriers and drivers who use them must discontinue use immediately and revert to paper logs or logging software to record required hours of service data and replace the revoked ELDs with compliant ones before January 30th. Keep an eye on the weather forecast if you're driving out east this weekend. Some areas are expected to get heavy rain, severe thunderstorms, and strong winds. Some might even see snow, and tornadoes aren't out of the question down south either. Some 180 million people are in the path of this system, which could disrupt travel on roadways. The system brought record amounts of rainfall to the Pacific Northwest earlier in the week. The number of people employed in the trucking industry was up last month, but only slightly. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says 700 trucking jobs were added in November. That's just the fifth monthly gain for the year as the trucking industry continues to move toward a yearly decline. David Spencer, vice president of market intelligence and Arrive Logistics, told Landline that the lack of fluctuation in trucking jobs during the fourth quarter suggests that the market remains sufficiently supplied to support demand. He added that capacity continues to exit at a slower pace than prior market cycles, likely due to record profits through the pandemic. Spencer said he expects further employment declines in the long term. Year-to-date, trucking jobs are down by nearly 26,000. Last year, they went up by nearly 61,000. Looking ahead to next week, the administrator of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is set to testify before a House subcommittee. Robin Hutchison is expected to provide testimony and answer questions during the Highways and Transit Subcommittee hearing dedicated to oversight of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Expect a lot of questions Wednesday on FMCSA's proposals regarding speed limiters, automatic emergency braking systems, and more. The agency has proposed mandates for both on heavy trucks. In addition to Administrator Hutchison, representatives from other DOT agencies like the Federal Highway Administration and National Highway Traffic Safety Administration will testify as well. Yellow has declined a long-shot bid to revive the company. In October, trucking company Jack Cooper reportedly made a $2 billion bid to buy up Yellow's assets, restructure the company, and bring it back to life. But the New York Times reports that Yellow's lawyers dismissed the attempt this week after determining that Jack Cooper's plan was, quote, not viable. Yellow filed for bankruptcy in August. The auctioning off of Yellow Properties nationwide has begun. A filing in a Delaware court shows that a number of carriers spent more than $1.8 billion buying up more than 125 properties over the past week. XPO, Estes Express Line, Sci and Knight Swift bought up that majority. There are still several dozen Yellow properties yet to be sold off, though. And there's also the matter of tens of thousands of Yellow tractors and trailers, which are being sold through auction houses. 
A trucking company that does a lot of its business as a contractor for the U.S. Postal Service is shutting down. Matheson Trucking and its subsidiaries have been notifying state authorities about mass layoffs and noting January 31st as their last day of business. Matheson has been around since the 1960s. A Kansas woman who stole tens of thousands of dollars from the trucking company she used to work for is headed to prison. Amy Shepard was sentenced to 18 months behind bars after pleading guilty to one count of wire fraud. Shepard used to work for Nebraska-based Roadrunner Temperature Controlled. She admitted to wiring fraudulent checks to a driver who was in on the scheme. In total, Shepard stole more than $110,000. She's been ordered to pay that back in addition to the prison time. Her accomplice pleaded guilty in September. He's said to be sentenced later this month. The Colorado Department of Transportation has closed a runaway truck ramp on Interstate 70 for construction. It's at mile marker 257 just east of Genesee. Crews will be out working on upgrades to the ramp. It's expected to reopen in May or June. Until then, there will be no escape ramp for trucks traveling on eastbound I-70 between the Eisenhower-Johnson Memorial Tunnel and the Denver metropolitan area. Because of that, the Colorado DOT says the speed limit will be reduced from 45 to 40 miles an hour between exits 253 and 258 for heavy trucks. CDOT says they're doing the bulk of the work during the winter months when the risk of hot brakes is lower and truckers are driving more slowly. Meanwhile, separate but related, the Colorado DOT has a video series dedicated to helping people stay safe on the state's mountainous highways. The Mountain Rules campaign has three new videos this year covering safe winter driving, hot brakes, runaway truck ramps, and more. Colorado can be a challenging state to drive in from sharp curves and steep downgrades to chain loss and quickly changing weather conditions. Truckers who frequently travel a state are probably aware of the challenges, but out-of-state drivers may not be. The series is designed for both, including passenger vehicle drivers. You can find the videos on the Colorado DOT's YouTube page. And finally, representatives from the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association showed up at the Veterans Community Project campus in Kansas City on Thursday bearing gifts. More specifically, a $10,000 check, money that was raised during the Truckers for Troops campaign. OOIDA also delivered a truckload of supplies for residents of the tiny home community, which provides housing, counseling, career and medical services and more for vets in need. Kristen Griffin, Communications and Events Coordinator for the Veterans Community Project, said they're grateful. Well, I have to say that OOIDA, Truckers for Troops, they've always come through for us. Um, They've been a longtime supporter of Veterans Community Project. And so um, we don't take anything for granted. But when we got the call from Narita that this was coming, yes, we were very excited and very thankful. And the funds will be put to a myriad of uses. Um, They're used for emergency assistance. They are used to um, provide the resources that our veterans need, whether they're in our outreach center or in our village, um, to recover and um, in dignity and get back up on their feet. The Truckers for Troops campaign is held every year the week leading up to Veterans Day. Part of the money goes toward the Veterans Community Project. The rest goes toward care packages that are put together and sent out to troops stationed overseas. Donations are accepted all year round, though, and care packages are sent out throughout the year as well. If you know of any active military or family members of the military interested in getting a Truckers for Troops care package, you can put in a request. We've got all that information on LandlineNow.com. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. A reminder that you can write a letter to your elected officials in Congress by using the website fightingfortruckers.com. Again, that website, fightingfortruckers.com. Next, Scott Thompson talks with Atri Research Associate Alex Leslie about predatory towing. We'll hear from Landline Magazine's Mark Schremer about his conversation with FMCSA's administrator. And Ashley Blackford has the story of a holiday gift from Canada that's a thank you to Boston. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com.
Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. And we're back. Our friends at the American Transportation Research Institute are out with a new report that outlines just how bad predatory towing has gotten and what efforts to stem the problem look like. Joining us with the details, Atri Research Associate Alex Leslie, who joins us on the line now. Alex, how you doing? Doing well, Scott. Great to be here. Always good to have you. We always uh, have interesting conversations about these interesting topics uh, that you put these reports out on. This one is very interesting, I found. Uh, again, with regard to predatory towing, let's start where we usually start here with these, the uh, origin story, I guess, of sorts of this study. We've all heard the stories, uh, of course, you have as well, about predatory towing practices and just how bad it's gotten. Uh, what was the goal, I suppose, at the outset of this study? Uh, was it just to find out who, how bad this issue has uh, has gotten over recent years? You know, that was a big part of it, Scott. It, the tricky thing with predatory towing is Every crash is unique, right? There are all kinds of different factors that go into this problem, uh, and and there's so little data out there. I I mean, before our study, there was there's almost no resources that you could go to to find actually how much of a problem this is, which has made combating it really challenging. I think for a lot of people. So a lot of our uh, a lot of the uh, trucking association state reps have have been raising this issue for a couple years now, and we've heard it a lot from. Uh, from OIDA certainly has taken a big role on this too, and our owner operators that we talked to. So uh, this was voted one of our top research priorities uh, last year. Did that make it challenging? Because as you mentioned there, this is sort of arbitrary in a way, right? Because we have these rates out there. There isn't a set rate necessarily for this type of thing. We know that the vast majority of tow companies out there are doing things the right way. They're not trying to cheat people out of money. It's really those few bad actors out there, or I guess more than a few, but, you know, the relatively small number of bad actors out there that are really giving the industry kind of a bad name with these practices. Uh, How did you go about trying to figure out, I suppose, you know, what predatory towing looks like specifically, uh, if that question makes any sense at all? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and, and, and I, you know, I want to echo what you said there too. A lot of great towing companies out there. The trucking industry could not work without good partners in the towing and recovery industry. And and frankly, they dislike predatory towing as much as any trucker does because that's that's hurting their image and it's hurting their business ultimately. So, um, the, the tricky thing about predatory towing is there's so many different ways that these practices can can slip in. Uh, so our first step was we, we did a big survey of, of motor carriers and owner-operators to figure out what kinds of issues are you actually encountering. Uh, and, and from that, we saw you know excessive hourly or per pound rates was the most common. Uh, about 83% of carriers experienced that in 2021. Uh, and that was followed by unwarranted extra charges for labor or equipment. Excessive daily storage rates, a couple of other big ones were delays or access issues on vehicles or cargo uh, and damage due to improper towing equipment. Also, vehicle seizure without causes. So as you can see, it's a whole span of issues there. And part of the problem, too, is that, of course, legislation, like you suggested, it varies from state to state, sometimes city to city, county to county. Uh, So again, just it's it's a real minefield for all kinds of uh, you might say creative, you might say nefarious <laughs> practice. Yeah. I want to go back to some of those numbers you mentioned there because I, I think they're pretty eye-opening when you take into account what they portray or what they say about what truckers are encountering out there. You get Again, you said nearly 83% of motor carriers said they had experienced excessive rates. About the same percentage said they had experienced unwarranted extra service charges. 
those are high numbers just on those two alone. Um, and as you said, there hasn't been a lot of study about this issue in particular. Uh, this is a very comprehensive look at the issue. Did those numbers surprise you? Because they surprised me a little bit, even knowing, again, uh, the stories or hearing the stories of people out there who have been taken advantage of. Those numbers are really high. Yeah, they are. And, and, you know, there's a couple caveats to be taken into those numbers. That's self-reported, of course, and that's, uh, you know, some of those are going to be large carriers who have, you know, hundreds of trucks. So, of course, you know, it's, it's they're much more likely to encounter it once yeah. in a year, which is why actually the second part of this research was so crucial, where we then went and we collected invoices from fleets and, uh, and from OIDA in order to be able to really analyze a set, complete group of towing invoices from a, a single time span. And, and in that, we found that 29.8% of invoices had some form of predatory billing. So, so either those excessive rates or those unwarranted extra service charges. Right. And that number certainly surprised me as well, because, again, we, we really looked into that. It's a very controlled, you know, <laughs> anyone who's really into the data analysis, you can read more about the method there. But, but it's a very controlled, reliable number on the frequency of these issues. And, and, and again, that's, that's pretty high. And we saw that uh, is partly across things like equipment rates themselves. About 6.3% of invoices we studied had excessive equipment rates. But a lot of it is the kind of nickel and diming that you see with miscellaneous fees. That was 8% of invoices had some predatory level of miscellaneous costs, which, you know, miscellaneous costs are unavoidable. Sometimes, you know, things like cleaning up oil, cleaning up, you know, taking out a drive shaft. But when you're seeing a bunch of costs for things like gloves, radios. Mm -hmm. Th those are the kinds of things where, where they add up and, uh, and quickly enter a, a predatory territory. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like when you go to the hospital for whatever procedure and, you know, you check the, you check the bill afterward and they've charged you, you know, $300 for uh, an aspirin pill or something. Uh, that's what it feels right. like with, with this. You know, we could talk numbers all day. And I think, again, these numbers are important because I don't think we had necessarily a clear-cut idea of just how big this problem has become. Um, and I guess I can ask you in kind of a, a more subjective way, these numbers do say that this is a big problem. I mean, again, whether you take that 83% or the 29% or whatever, we're throwing numbers all over the place, but they do paint a picture of a very problematic uh, issue in trucking. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. It, it is. It's not a... <laughs> It's not an if, it's a when, is, is what these numbers are high enough to suggest, basically. Right. Basically, not an if, but a when as to when you are going to need a towing service and you are going to encounter something like this, in other words. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. So we've established that this is a problem, um, which obviously is the first step, I think, to coming up with solutions. And as we kind of mentioned there earlier, we've got a patchwork of different states and cities and, I mean— the regulations and rules throughout the country are all over the place when it comes to predatory towing in particular. Uh, your report did look at, right, the causes, the solutions, and what maybe we can do to kind of stem this problem or at least start to, to stem this problem. What can be done or I guess what should be done to, um, you know, spearhead these efforts and, and get them started in earnest to make sure that fewer people are, are getting, you know, screwed over, essentially. Yeah. You know, it, it's a problem that has a lot of different groups involved, and it's going to take work from, from all of them to solve, right? You know, like, we need some better regulations in a lot of states, things like requiring invoice itemization. It's really hard to know if you're being charged in a predatory manner if you don't know what you're being charged for, right? things like cargo release and, and actually giving explicit priority to motor carriers or owner operators to choose a towing company of their preference. Some states have laws on the books that, that say, you know, it would be nice if, if that happens, but, but there's no real force. And so it often doesn't happen 
in practice. And for those regulations to take place, you know, we need good advocacy, and we also need cooperation with, uh, you know, in partnership with the uh, towing and recovery industry itself. Uh, a couple key things that drivers and owner-operators can do is, is, is if you're in a crash, take pictures and videos of everything. Your vehicle, your cargo, your trailer. Also, other vehicles involved in the crash. The state of the roadway or, or any surrounding I- environmental impacts. Uh, and, and then also any recovery process. You know, how many wreckers are actually on the scene? What's, what's actually taking place? You know, if you have that evidence, you can right away nip in the bud a lot of the ways that, that towing companies can, uh, if they so wish, you know, take on predatory billing. Um, another key one for drivers uh, that I want to really emphasize is uh, do not sign any consent forms mm-hmm. on the side of the road. Uh, you do not have to do that. You should not do that. Uh, and it can get you into a lot of trouble. It can cause the the tow to no longer be covered by any existing regulations that may be there to protect you, uh, and it can cause you to approve uh, rates that may be predatory. So, uh, again, don't sign any consent forms on the roadside. Yeah, I mean, taking a whack at this issue, you know, it starts obviously with the incident that we're talking about on a personal level for those people. When you look at the bigger problem and any time you want to solve a bigger problem, it's going to take more time and more effort. Is this just a matter of getting this message out to local communities and states and putting these rules on the books? I mean, what is what does that look like, I suppose, based on your research um, in, you know, how we really need to go about making sure that this issue kind of goes away and and everybody's on on level level ground here? Yeah. Yeah. I think the first step is, you know, control what you can definitely control, right? We've got to make sure that drivers and owner operators know the things that they can do to prevent predatory attempts from getting any farther. You know, those things like I just said, Mm -hmm. photographs, don't sign anything. Next, then we, we got to get more of this information out there. Things like what excessive rates actually look like, the kind of, you know, nitty gritty numbers that are in this report so that, again, people actually know this is a real problem. It can happen to you, and you need to know what to be able to do. And then finally, yeah, we need, we need to have continued steps to, uh, you know, combat this issue at the regulatory re- level. And I know that there are some states who have recently had some success on this. I know Maryland has just uh, passed some new rules that, uh, that look like they will be effective. And so, you know, continuing that effort on the advocacy side is something that I know that the state associations are interested in, and, and hopefully this report will, will help give them a bit of that, um, uh, you know, data background to, to be able to push those things forward. Yeah, absolutely. And as you mentioned there, um, there are towing associations out there who also don't like this. They don't like predatory mm-hmm. towing because, as you said earlier, this gives everybody a bad name when this happens. Uh, and we've got, frankly, small business truckers cannot afford um, to pay some of these bills, and it puts people out of business. So it's definitely an issue uh, that is important. Uh, it is affecting people, and I think this report does go a long way to answering some questions and, again, hopefully pushing people in the right direction to taking action to make sure that this, uh, again, practice goes away. Alex, we really appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate you putting the work in on this report. I, I do think it uh, – it's going to have some value down the line. So uh, we, uh, we thank you for your time. Absolutely. And, and, you know, shout out to the work you guys have done. I know you've done a lot of stories over the few years here on, on predatory towing as well. And, uh, you know, getting that information out there definitely helps everyone. So Absolutely. That was Alex Leslie of the American Transportation Research Institute. You can check out this report for yourself on their website, truckingresearch.org, and check out their other studies while you're there as well. We've got a break coming up fast, but don't go anywhere. There's more Landline now on the other side. Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. 
Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. Welcome back to Landline Now. There was an event last week in Kansas City dedicated to commercial vehicle safety. In fact, that's basically the name of the event. The Midwest Commercial Vehicle Safety Summit yielded a lot of interesting conversations and perspectives, and Landline Magazine's Mark Schrimmer was there to cover it. He joins us now in Studio A with some of the highlights. Mark, always good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. Let's start with the, uh, I guess, the opening act of the summit, uh, which also (laughs) happened to be the headliner, I think, too. Uh, FMCSA Administrator Robin Hutchison. I know she held a, I think they call it a fireside chat. I'm not sure if there was a fireplace there, but uh, that's basically what it was. Uh, And I know you had a chance to speak with her afterward as well. The takeaway, I think, and you're going to tell us, obviously, more than I ever will, uh, is that the agency is really forging full steam ahead on some of their more controversial rulemakings. And that was made pretty clear, I think, throughout the comments that were were made there. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you look at um, kind of her presentation overall, and like I said, it was it wasn't her just delivering a speech. It, it was her kind of being being interviewed a little mm-hmm. bit. But as with anything, um, I think there were there was some good and and there was some some bad some things that uh, truckers uh, uh, wouldn't like and um, but she kind of started off with things that I think a lot of uh, drivers would like and and that uh, have been said all the time. Um, you know, we, when we look at crashes and we look at highway safety, uh, we can't always just focus on. Um, okay, th- this this crash happened, and the and the truck driver is bad because the crash happened. Um, she did spend considerable amount of her time talking about the root causes of of crashes and looking at the things that we can do to help truck drivers. Maybe we look at the way drivers are being paid, the whole you know mileage pay system. Um, you know, I don't think she mentioned it specifically, but but kind of alluded to the idea of we've talked about whether truck drivers should be uh, you know eligible for overtime uh, pay, um, those type of things. Them being, and she did mention you know detention time being held up for 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 hours is is are those things like that? If is a truck driver being stuck at a shipper receiver for for several hours and now. They're they're supposed to get to their destination, um, you know, at, at this time. But now their hours of service are about to run out. Does yeah. that encourage them to go just a little bit faster? Um, does it, you know, uh, does all, it... all music to our ears to hear these things? However, there's a record scratch in there <laughs> as well, right? Because it, we were talking earlier too. There, there are contradictions. It seems like I think sure. is maybe the right way to put it with regard to those things which we all know are issues that need to be addressed. It is refreshing to hear an administrator of FMCSA talk about those things and understand that those are big problems. But at the same time... (laughs) There's always a but, right? Yeah, exactly. And as we talked about a a couple of days ago with Ashley Blackford uh, here, you know, still pursuing speed limiters, still pursuing automatic emergency braking systems, these things that are going to have a big effect on experienced drivers who, in a lot of cases, are going to say, I've had enough, I'm, I'm leaving. Yeah, and that's that's something that I think you kind of talked about maybe with the administrator. I know you yeah. you did talk to her, and was that something you you did you did bring up? Yeah, with her? yeah, we, we talked about that a little bit. I mean, I, I I would say that the the two big things that that have maybe contradictions in them. Like I said, there was a lot of focus uh, throughout her presentation where she talked about um, that experienced drivers are the safest drivers on the road. We need to. Um, when she was talking about addressing these root causes, it was all about um, retaining drivers because if you keep drivers in the industry, that means they'll become experienced drivers and then they'll be safer. And that's one way to go about uh, safety. As you mentioned, um, if you go through the the you know the speed limiter uh, rulemaking, uh, for instance, we had fifteen thousand comments, and you can find a lot of them from truck drivers opposed. Who say if you pass this, I'm I'm leaving the industry, and these might be the people with a million, two million safe miles a lot of the time, and they're saying they'll leave. Same thing with the automatic emergency braking. You 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 hear that. Um, other contradiction that that I would uh, say is that there was a lot of focus uh, throughout 
um, her presentation that talked about um, that we need to rulemakings and, and regulations and things and our safety plans have to be tailored towards specific states and regions. Uh, but meanwhile, now we have we have not seen the formal proposal on speed limiters, but all indications are that it is going to include a single top speed. And it, if it does that, say 68 miles an hour is what they end up introducing as the top speed, um, that will not uh, be tailored towards states. It will mm-hmm. be – and you're seeing – we've already heard – Oklahoma, um, a lot of the rural states um, are arguing, you know, this isn't something you should be applying to us. This doesn't work everywhere. All of these type of things. Same thing with automatic emergency braking systems. Again, if you put that just as a federal mandate everywhere, um, have you tested it properly in some of the northern states, some of, you know, on in, in icy conditions and, in, in, yeah. you know, hilly and mountainous conditions, all, all of those type of uh, a situation. So, um, you know, like I said, going back, th- there's some good in it, but but then also looking at, they do seem very uh, determined uh, to move forward with these. She couldn't speak um, in my one-on-one interaction with her. She couldn't speak uh, specifically on the details of what's going to be coming out of the speed limiter uh, proposal, um, but that is um, on the schedule to be released December 29th, I believe. Yep. So, before the end of the year, it's possible that we'll we'll know more. Um, but yeah, that's so. It was a I would say it was definitely a mixed bag what we what we got out of the administrator at the safety summit. Yeah, and to be fair and, and to be understanding of this, um, you're not going to please all the people all the time, which we all understand. Um, it's just these things that you would hope uh, FMCSA and officials there, policymakers, are listening to and understanding the concerns and taking them into consideration when they make these rules uh, and maybe trying to find a balance between the two. Again, you're not going to please all the people all the time. I understand that. Uh, But again, it's refreshing uh, to hear these things, uh, the understanding of, of all the challenges that are out there. That's why it is maybe a bit frustrating to hear and see these other rules that are coming out. Speaking of which, um, this summit had a lot of great conversations, a lot of great sessions, uh, really focused on a number of safety issues from professors and, you know, industry stakeholders and and so on and so forth. One of the more interesting things, I I think, and I got this from your article on landline.media, Casey Phillips, the host of Road Dog Live on Mm -hmm. the Road Dog Trucking channel, um, gave a presentation and essentially let his listeners give it in a way. I'll let you explain kind of what he did there, but I thought it was very interesting and I hope people were listening to to what he said. Yeah, and and, and I think this was really important because as as good as this safety summit has been this year and last year, um, if there's a criticism uh, that I would have toward it is that, you know, it, it's full of um, people that work with uh, FMCSA. It's full of uh, top, uh, you know, uh, industry uh, leaders and uh, educators that uh, that study uh, the trucking industry. So there's a lot of great stuff that, that's coming out of academia and everything else. Um, but there's not a great truck driver presence. Uh, last year, uh, luckily, uh, the OIDA Foundation was um, asked to give a presentation. And so they were able to kind of represent uh, the truck driver's view. This year, they asked Um, Like you said, Road Dog uh, radio host, KC Phillips. And what he did is basically, my understanding is that he uh, spent, I think, two of his radio uh, shows uh, leading up to this and basically called them listening sessions Mm -hmm. and said, uh, truck drivers, call in. Vent. Yeah. (laughs) What's going on? Let me know. Vent for hours straight here and tell me uh, the things that I need to relay uh, to all of these uh, FMCSA workers and, and DOT officials that are sitting there in, in the audience. And so he had like an hour uh, to basically give the truck driver's perspective. And, and it's and it's really uh, important. And, and I'd say the big one that he passed on um, to kind of start, he asked, what do you think the biggest uh, criticism that drivers have – of regulators, people working at FMCSA. And I think you could uh, hear somebody say, oh, too many regulations. 
while that obviously is is a common complaint, that wasn't the top one. The one, Scott, I'm sure you know, can probably guess as well what it is, is that the people making these regulations, doing the rules, all the people, they've never driven a truck. They've never been in a truck mm-hmm. oftentimes, and they, they don't know. And they may not even be talking to truck drivers. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. if, if you expect this safety summit to, um, you know, p- prompt new regulations or, or different ways of improving safety, if that's what the plan of it is, and that, that is what the, the mission statement of, of this has been the last two years, you didn't bring drivers in. There weren't, yeah. you know, the, there weren't several tables uh, full of, of actual truck drivers there ev- giving their perspective. So, um, yeah, th- that's the biggest criticism that I, that I think most truck drivers would have is that you're, you're making the decisions on how to improve highway safety out on the roads from people who aren't out on the roads uh, yeah. in the truck uh, dealing with it. And all of, in every regulation that you put out, uh, or at least the majority of them, are focused on the 90, 95% of, of the ones that, you know, the, the crashes are not their fault. Yeah. The, the primary, uh, you know, fault crash is coming uh, of the, the passenger vehicle driver, yet every time we roll out a rule, it's usually on, on the truck driver. That is an important message. Now here's a question: <laughs> Who was he delivering that message to? I mean, who who was in the audience? Who was listening? And who took that into account? Hopefully, people did. Uh, and you were there, so you probably might have a better uh, you have a better answer than I would, obviously. But did that message uh, was that message received by anybody within FMCSA that was there? Do we do we know who who was listening and so, how that was received? Um, so I don't believe like the the administrator right. had stuck around for it, but I do know there were plenty of people that work um, maybe from FMCSA or state DOTs. Sure. Like even at the table that I was at, there were people that worked. I think one of them he he was based out of uh, Topeka, Kansas, um, that that came in uh, for it. So there were a lot of people that do work uh, in the you know for the Department of Transportation that were in the audience to hear it yeah um, and, and state troopers those type of people so um, am I saying that that message is suddenly gonna change everything hey, tomorrow Mark, we solved all the problems we're good <laughs> but we're good but no th- there were definitely people there um, and, and you could you could see that that it did uh, resonate with with some of the people in the audience and some of the people that probably, uh, needed to hear it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would have been nice if if the administrator was there for it, and sure. and and uh, you know even uh, you know all the all the top decision makers. But there definitely were people um, because, like I said, most of the audience weren't truck drivers. They right. were they yeah. were the university leaders. They were the people that work for the DOT or or state departments. Understandable. And you know, I, I just want to say too that I I come from a place I believe that the people putting these policies in place have good intentions. And we've talked about this before. I I think that they, many of them, you know, are taking a path that they see as being a path toward, uh, you know, a better environment, safer roadways, however you want to put it. It's just that divide, I think, that is there, that is so glaring to people who understand what the issues are and see these policies and see what the unintended consequences may be. And hopefully that message... uh, is accepted and received (laughs) and there is more communication at the very least and understanding about where everybody's coming from. Um, I don't think we solved all the problems, Mark, but we tried, I guess. I think 90%. 90%. Yeah, we're there. Absolutely. Uh, Mark, always a pleasure. We appreciate it and we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks, Scott. You can check out Mark's work at Landline.media pretty much every day and in every issue of Landline Magazine. As for us here at Landline Now, we'll be back in just a moment. Stick around. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com, because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. 
Every year, the Boston Common lights up with a Christmas tree that comes from the province of Nova Scotia. It's a decades-old tradition that has great meaning for the people on the East Coast. Blake Sardi joins me now. He works for the province of Nova Scotia. Blake, this is the first year you got to haul the tree. How did that all come about? This is my first year doing it correct, yeah. We had a gentleman, Dave McTrarland, that's done it for the past Oh, eight to ten years, uh, he moved on with the department. So when my manager and supervisor approached me, and I was more than willing and quite honored to take on the privilege. Can you talk to me a little bit about the significance of this tree and sort of the backstory for those who aren't familiar? Yeah, well, the backstory is we had uh, two ships collide in the harbor, and there was a massive explosion, and it... Uh, Debris flew for like two kilometer area and pretty much devastated the the harbor frontage there. And Boston sent up uh, people to help with the casualties, the injured, and the rebuilding. They set us up uh, funding, and they really went above and beyond to help uh, the devastation that happened here in Nova Scotia. Can you talk to me a little bit about, when it comes to the logistics side of this, how does this all get planned out? Well, like they plan out now, uh, people put in a request uh, for a tree, like they have a tree and they put it in and then they work at it all year. People go around and look at these trees and try to pick out one that you know, uh, is good, the right size and for us being able to get at it, to load it on and take it down to Boston. Do you know how big this one was? Do you know the measurements of it? This this one here this year was 45 feet, if I remember correctly. Oh, wow. Between 40 and 45 feet. And it was a white spruce. Where did it come from? Uh, it come from Stewiak. Stewiak. There was a family in Stewiak that they planted the tree in front of their house 40 years ago, and they decorated it every year at Christmas time. And they decided it got a little too big, and uh, they decided to put in for it to have it donated. Wow. Can you describe what it's like? Were you able to be at the tree cutting ceremony? Yes, yes, yes. I attended the tree cutting ceremony. It's quite an event. I mean, uh, we have the local news and radio stations there for it. Uh, there's usually a couple of elementary school classes that come and dignitaries. It's quite a quite an event to have this when they cut the tree. And yeah, I mean, it really is like, I know the community all comes together. Um, it's kind of incredible that it, it's been continued to be done all these years later. Um, talk to me a little bit more about that, about, you know, this is a very important thing in Nova Scotia. It is. It's just Nova Scotians is still quite close to their heart, you know, with what Boston went, what they'd done, you know, above and beyond, you know, helping out. So they just want to show their thanks and appreciation, you know, and they don't want to let it. It's it's an age old tradition that it's it's quite an event, you know. People don't want to forget, and you run into a lot of people that you know still to this day remember. There's still remnants of the explosion in Halifax. What are some of the things, um, you know, when it comes to planning out your route and and hauling the tree that you have to keep in mind? Well, the one thing we do after we do the tree cutting ceremony itself, they have a parade of lights in Halifax here on Saturday evening. And what we usually do, we decorate the tree. Uh, Department of National Resources folks come out and they, uh, they hand out little tree saplings to the people sort of so they can take home and plant their own tree, you know, hand it out to the children and stuff. And what's it like hauling a load that obviously this must catch a lot of people's attention? It does. It does. It's rather nice because every place we stop, you know, like everybody wants to get their picture taken with the tree, you know, and then they ask questions about it. But some people still don't really know, but this sort of uh, gives them a little history and background on what is represented with us taking the tree down, you know, like once we leave Halifax, you know, we usually have a couple schools we stop at, you know, and the kids, they really relate, 
once they see the tree and then they go back into the classroom, like the teachers say, then they, uh, they really are interested in how it come about and what happened. And, you know, then we stop in Amherst. It's the last place before we leave Nova Scotia and they have a little send off there, you know, before we go. And there's like, we'll stop at the border at Holton, Maine, and usually like die search truck stop in Herman, Maine. And a lot of people, every time you stop, there's somebody coming up and wanting their picture taken and, you know, asking questions where it comes from. And, and it's quite, quite mind blowing, really. What's the reaction like um, of the people who don't know the story and you kind of give them kind of the brief um, of what happened and, and why Nova Scotia continues to send this tree? Well, they, they sort of, it's an eye-opener for them because, like you said, they don't know, and, and you know, and then it just refreshes their memory to a lot of them. And, like, they're just in awe that, you know, we still do this in respect for, for Boston for what they've done for us, right? They just think it's just a, an honorable uh, thing to do. Do you know how many years this has been going on? Uh, we started hauling, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 1971. Oh, wow. We started taking the tree down. It's gone every year since. Nice. You know, even through the COVID, we couldn't take the tree down ourselves, but they sent it down by ship. Oh, wow. You know, to still keep the tradition going, right? You know. Hmm. How neat is it for you to be part of this tradition that, you know, dates back decades Oh, it's, 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 it's an honor, you know, like I, I, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of it because like you say, it's just an educational event and historical event that we keep going. It's really quite an honor. Like I was really, uh, glad that they offered me the opportunity to take it down and be part of this, right? And had you, had you ever hauled a Christmas tree before of this length? Not of this length and size, no. I've hauled Christmas trees before, like just your normal average Christmas tree down to the U.S. and stuff like that. No, nothing of this size and magnitude, no. Was anything difficult about it? No, not really. The only the only thing that's difficult is just the width of the tree. I mean, it's quite wide, but uh, we have... Uh, police escorts and stuff from when we leave Nova Scotia until we get to the border. And when we go into Boston, uh, the Boston police come out and meet us and escort us into town. And it really, like you say, it goes quite smoothly Mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of people down through Maine and Massachusetts, they still remember it and they see us every year. So it's it's really nice. Mm Mm-hmm. And lastly, you know, again, why is it so important, you know, all these years later that people of Nova Scotia take the opportunity, um, you know, there's a lot of people involved in this, the people, you know, willing to donate this, the trees that they grow um, every year, that the people who come out for it and, you know, yourself who drives it and just all the logistics of it. How important is it that the people take this opportunity to continue to thank Boston for the efforts to help in that time of tragedy? Well, it's quite important because there's still a long history of we're almost like neighbors. And like you say, people are really want to show each other their thanks for what they've done for us and still do, you know, in hard times, like with uh, Fiona, like with the power outages and stuff, like Boston sent up uh, light and power trucks and stuff to assist us like that neighborly. Uh, atmosphere still goes on to this day, right? Mm -hmm. It certainly does. That was Blake Sardi talking about the Boston Christmas tree that is an annual gift from the people of Nova Scotia. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's Landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. 
I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. <laughs> and I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And, and together, together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com. 